Uh, thanks, Wendy. Can... I might have to put this down again for the debaters. Let's just see. I don't know. Anyway, I would also like to welcome you on behalf of myself and the UBC Debate Society. Um, my job today is to provide you with an outline of the format of the debate and to introduce the uh, debaters. So starting on the theist side of this debate, we have Dr. William Craig. Uh, he is a professor of philosophy at the Talbot School of Theology, which is in California. Somewhere I didn't write down where it was in California. <laughs> He has not one but two PhDs, which are in philosophy and theology. Um, and these were gotten in England and Germany, correct? Yes. Yes. And he has been the author or editor of over 30 books, and I've, I know none of their titles. Um, <laughs> but you can find them on his webpage, which is www.reasonablefaith.org. So if any of you guys are interested in more information about Dr. Craig, just go to that website. On the atheist side, we have, to, we have Dr. John Shook. He is actually the vice president and a senior research fellow at the Center for Inquiry Transnational, which is in the state of New York, although not the city. Yes? Wow. Uh, he has one doctorate, which is in philosophy from the University of Buffalo, and he has also written books. Um, <laughs> His most recent being a, called A Companion to Pragmatism. So welcome to both debaters. Okay, so without further ado, to represent the theist side of the debate, Does God Exist? I'd like to invite Dr. William Craig. Thank you, and good evening. It's great to be here tonight. I want to begin by thanking the ACC for the invitation to participate in tonight's debate. And it's my sincere hope that our discussion this evening will be a very practical help to you as you think about this most important topic. Now, in preparing for tonight's debate, I took the time to explore Dr. Shook's very interesting website, and I discovered that he's an ardent naturalist. Now, you ask, what is naturalism? Well, here's his definition. Naturalism is the view that the only reality, the only reality is the physical reality of energy and matter as gradually discovered by experience, reason, and science. Dr. Shook believes that there is nothing beyond the physical world. By contrast, I believe that as we probe the natural world, we encounter, as it were, signposts of transcendence pointing beyond the natural world to its ground in a supernatural reality. So tonight's debate is really a debate between naturalism and supernaturalism. Accordingly, I'm going to defend two basic contentions in tonight's debate. First, that there are no good reasons to think that naturalism is true. And second, that there are good reasons to think that supernaturalism is true. Now I'll leave it up to Dr. Shook to present the arguments for naturalism before I respond to them in my next speech. But I simply want to note in passing that on his website he gives only one argument for naturalism and to my surprise that argument was logically invalid. Uh, that is to say, even if you grant all of its premises, the conclusion doesn't follow from the premises. And so I'll be anxious to see if he presents that one tonight. Turn then uh, to that second contention. What good reasons are there to think that supernaturalism is true? Well, tonight I'm going to sketch five arguments which constitute a cumulative case for the existence of a reality beyond the universe, which is plausibly called God. Number one, the origin of the universe points to the existence of a transcendent creator. Have you ever asked yourself where the universe came from? Why everything exists? Typically, naturalists have said that the universe is just eternal and uncaused. But there are good reasons, both philosophically and scientifically, to doubt that this is the case. Philosophically, the idea of an infinite past seems absurd. Just think about it for a minute. 
If the universe never had a beginning, that means that the number of events in the past history of the universe is infinite. But mathematicians recognize that the existence of an actually infinite number of things leads to self-contradictions. For example, what is infinity minus infinity? Well, mathematically, you get self-contradictory answers. This shows that infinity is just an idea in your mind, not something that exists in reality. But that entails that the number of past events must therefore be finite. Therefore, the series of past events can't go back and back forever. Rather, the universe must have begun to exist. This conclusion has been confirmed by remarkable discoveries in astronomy and astrophysics. In one of the most startling developments of modern science, we now have pretty strong evidence that the universe is not eternal in the past, but had an absolute beginning about 13 billion years ago in a cataclysmic event called the Big Bang. What makes the Big Bang so startling is that it represents the origin of the universe from literally nothing. For all matter and energy, even physical space and time themselves, came into being at the Big Bang. As the physicist Paul Davies explains, the coming into being of the universe as discussed in modern science is not just a matter of imposing some sort of organization upon a previous incoherent state, but literally the coming into being of all physical things from nothing. Now, of course, alternative theories have been crafted over the years to try to avoid this absolute beginning. But none of these theories has commended itself to the scientific community as more plausible than the Big Bang Theory. In fact, in 2003, Arvind Bord, Alan Guth, and Alexander Vilenkin were able to prove that any universe which is, on average, in a state of cosmic expansion cannot be eternal in the past, but must have an absolute beginning. Vilenkin pulls no punches. He writes, it is said that an argument is what convinces reasonable men, and a proof is what it takes to convince even an unreasonable man. With the proof now in place, cosmologists can no longer hide behind the possibility of a past eternal universe. There is no escape. They have to face the problem of a cosmic beginning." End quote. That problem was nicely captured by Anthony Kenney of Oxford University. He writes, a proponent of the Big Bang Theory, at least if he is an atheist, must believe that the universe came from nothing and by nothing. But surely that doesn't make sense. For such a conclusion is, in the words of philosopher of science Bernhard Kanitscheider, in head-on collision with the most successful ontological commitment in the history of science, namely the principle that out of nothing, nothing comes. So why does the universe exist? Where did it come from? There must have been a cause which brought the universe into being. And we can summarize our argument thus far as follows. Premise one, whatever begins to exist has a cause. Two, the universe began to exist. Three, therefore, the universe has a cause. Now, as the cause of space and time, this being must be an uncaused, timeless, spaceless, immaterial being of unfathomable power. Moreover, it must be personal as well. Why? because this cause must be beyond space and time. Therefore, it cannot be physical or material. Now, there are only two kinds of things that fit that description, either abstract objects like numbers or else an intelligent mind. But abstract objects can't cause anything. It therefore follows that the cause of the universe is a transcendent personal mind. And thus we're brought not merely to a supernatural cause of the universe, but to its personal creator. Number two, the fine tuning of the universe for intelligent life points to a designer of the cosmos. In recent decades, scientists have been stunned by the discovery 
that our universe appears to be fine-tuned for the existence of intelligent life with a precision and delicacy that literally defy human comprehension. For example, if the force of gravity or the atomic weak force had been altered by as little as one part out of 10 to the 100th power, the universe would not have been life permitting. Now there are only three possible explanations of this extraordinary fine tuning. Physical necessity, chance, or design. Now, it can't be due to physical necessity because the constants and quantities in question are independent of the laws of nature. In fact, string theory predicts that there are around 10 to the 500th power differentiable universes compatible with nature's laws. So, could the fine-tuning be due to chance? Well, the problem with this alternative is that the probability that all the constants and quantities would fall by chance alone into the life-permitting range is vanishingly small. We now know that life-prohibiting universes are incomprehensibly more probable than any sort of life-permitting universe. So if the universe were the product of chance, the odds are overwhelming that the universe would be life-prohibiting. In order to rescue the alternative of chance, naturalists have therefore been forced to adopt the extraordinary hypothesis that there exists an infinite number of randomly ordered universes composing a sort of world ensemble or multiverse in which our universe is but a part. Somewhere in this infinite world ensemble, finely tuned universes will appear by chance alone and we happen to be one such world. There are, however, at least two major failings with the world ensemble hypothesis. First, there's no evidence that a world ensemble exists. There's no evidence that there even are other worlds, much less that they are randomly ordered and infinite. Second, if our universe is just a random member of a world ensemble, then it's overwhelmingly more probable that we should be observing a much smaller universe. Roger Penrose of Oxford University has calculated that it is inconceivably more probable that our solar system should form suddenly by the random collision of particles than that a finely tuned universe should exist. Uh, Penrose calls it utter chicken feed by comparison. So, if our universe is just a member randomly of the world ensemble, it is inconceivably more probable that we should be observing a universe no larger than our solar system. Observable universes like that are simply far more plenteous in the world ensemble than worlds like ours, and therefore ought to be observed by us. Since we do not have such observations, that fact strongly disconfirms the world ensemble hypothesis. On naturalism, then, at least, it is highly probable that there is no world ensemble. And thus, the last ring of defense for the alternative of chance collapses. So, we may argue as follows. Premise one, the fine-tuning of the universe is due to either physical necessity, chance, or design. Two, the fine-tuning is not due to physical necessity or to chance. Three, therefore, it is due to design. Thus, the fine-tuning of the universe points to the existence of a supernatural designer of the universe. Number three, objective moral values are plausibly grounded in God. The Achilles heel of naturalism is that it has no grounds for normative action. Nothing is forbidden. Everything is permitted. Dr. Shook recognizes this. On his website, he espouses what he calls naturalist truths. On this view, morality is just a set of recommendations for achieving certain goals, whatever they may be. He compares it to agriculture. Agriculture, he says, consists of recommendations for growing crops. For example, if you want to grow corn, then you should use fertilizer. But no one is under any obligation to grow corn or anything else. And it's the same with morality. 
The problem is this is massively contrary to moral experience. On the relativistic view, the psychopath who considers it a good thing to rape and kill little children does nothing wrong. For relative to his personal goals and desires, this is what he should do. A society like Nazi Germany cannot be condemned for sending millions of Jews, gypsies, and homosexuals to the gas chambers for, according to their value system, this was good. Anyone with a sound moral sense knows that this cannot be right. Experience is supposed to be one of the arbiters of truth for the naturalist. But in moral experience, we apprehend a realm of objective moral values. Dr. Shook admits, and I quote, nothing in the natural world, such as human beings, human societies, human life on earth, can be responsible for absolute moral truths. It follows that they must be grounded in a supernatural reality. So we may argue as follows. One, if God does not exist, objective moral values do not exist. Two, objective moral values do exist, from which it follows logically and inescapably that three, therefore, God exists. Number four, the historical facts concerning the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus imply God's existence. The historical person, Jesus of Nazareth, was a remarkable individual. Historians have reached something of a consensus that the historical Jesus came on the scene with an unprecedented sense of divine authority, the authority to stand and speak in God's place. He claimed that in himself the kingdom of God had come, and as visible demonstrations of this fact, he carried out a ministry of miracles and exorcisms. But the supreme confirmation of his claim was his resurrection from the dead. If Jesus did really rise from the dead, then it would seem that we have a divine miracle on our hands, and thus evidence for the existence of God. Now, most people would probably think that the resurrection of Jesus is something you just believe in by faith or not. But there are actually three established facts recognized by the majority of historians today, which I believe are best explained by the resurrection of Jesus. Fact number one. On the Sunday after his crucifixion, Jesus' tomb was found empty by a group of his women followers. According to Jakob Kramer, an Austrian specialist in the study of the resurrection narratives, by far most scholars hold firmly to the reliability of the biblical statements about the empty tomb. Fact number two, on separate occasions, different individuals and groups of people experienced appearances of Jesus alive after his death. According to the prominent New Testament critic, Gerald Ludemann, it may be taken as historically certain that the disciples had experiences after Jesus' death, in which Jesus appeared to them as the risen Christ. These appearances were witnessed not only by believers, but also by skeptics, unbelievers, and even enemies. Fact number three, the original disciples suddenly came to believe in the resurrection of Jesus despite having every predisposition to the contrary. Jews had no belief in a dying, much less rising Messiah, and Jewish beliefs about the afterlife precluded anyone's rising from the dead before the end of the world. Nevertheless, the original disciples came to believe so strongly that God had raised Jesus from the dead that they were willing to die for the truth of that belief. N.T. Wright, an eminent New Testament scholar, concludes, that is why, as an historian, I cannot explain the rise of early Christianity unless Jesus rose again, leaving an empty tomb behind him. Attempts to explain away these three great facts, uh, like the disciples stole the body or Jesus wasn't really dead, have been universally rejected by contemporary scholarship. The simple fact is that there just is no plausible naturalistic explanation of these facts. And therefore, it seems to me, the Christian is amply justified in believing that Jesus rose from the dead and was claimed to be. But that entails that God exists. And thus, we have a good inductive argument for the existence of God based on the resurrection of Jesus. One. There are three established facts about Jesus, his empty tomb, his post-mortem appearances, and the origin of the disciples' belief in his resurrection. 
Two, the hypothesis God raised Jesus from the dead is the best explanation of these facts. Three, the hypothesis God raised Jesus from the dead entails that the God revealed by Jesus exists. And four, therefore, the God revealed by Jesus exists. Finally, number five, you can experience God personally. You can know God exists simply by immediately experiencing him. This was the way that people in the Bible knew God. As Professor John Hick explains, God was known to them as a dynamic will, interacting with their own wills, a sheer given reality, as inescapably to be reckoned with as destructive storm and life-giving sunshine. To them, God was not an idea adopted by the mind, but an experienced reality which gave significance to their lives. The naturalist recognizes experience to be one of the avenues to truth, but we can come to know God through experience. We mustn't so concentrate on the arguments that we fail to hear the inner voice of God speaking to our hearts. For those who listen, God becomes an immediate reality in their lives. In conclusion then, we've seen five reasons to think that God exists. If Dr. Shook wants us to believe naturalism instead, then he must first tear down all five of the reasons that I presented and then in their place erect a case of his own to show that the only reality is physical reality. Unless and until he does that, I think that supernaturalism is the more plausible worldview. Thank you, Dr. Craig. I would now like to invite Dr. John Shook up for a 20-minute uh, opening remark. Well, thank you very much. This is my first visit to Vancouver. It's a lovely city. My hosts have been wonderful. Let me extend my thanks to the organizers of this debate and for my hosts for taking such good care of me. I've enjoyed many terrific conversations with them while here. Let me also extend my thanks to Dr. Craig for agreeing to participate in this important debate. Let me also mention that my organization, the Center for Inquiry, has a representative here who is operating a booth outside where there's information available about a UBC and also a Simon Fraser Freethinkers group that is being organized and there's information outside. It's only natural for a religious person to be curious about atheism. I'd like to speak directly to religious people first for a little while. If you happen to believe in the existence of a God, then there is a difference between you and I. But this is really a small difference. Over the centuries and millennia, most people have been believing in thousands of gods. You don't believe in almost any of those gods, and I don't believe in any of them. I just believe in one less God than you do, and that's really a small difference. <laughs> When a theist and an atheist come together to discuss the reasons for and against religious beliefs, they demonstrate their shared commitment to human intelligence. People who are committed to reason are proud to publicly share their humble efforts to understand reality and humanity's place in the world. This university, like every institution of higher learning, represents civilization's faith in the power of the human mind. All people who make up this university and every university, and people who come to speak at university events, display this respect for the human mind and show respect for the cooperative efforts of sincere people who pursue the truth together. This debate exemplifies this respect that the mind deserves. We are proud of this institution, and we are proud of you for being here to participate in this life of the mind. All right. An atheist, who is an atheist? Dr. Craig gave us portions of his definition of what a theist is. Uh, he may have more to say on that score. I'm going to try to explain what an atheist is. An atheist is simply a person who demands good reasons for all beliefs and doesn't find the reasons given for any religion to be convincing. An atheist is therefore someone who lives without belief in a god. Atheists are happy to take responsibility for their lives. They wish they lived in a world where more people took that same responsibility. 
Atheists imagine a world to come in which people respectfully debate the reasons for and against belief in all these gods that are available. Today we live at a midway point between a time when only blind faith and priestly authority controlled religion and a future time when any remaining religious belief has been thoroughly examined and tested by reason and science. I do not yet know what sort of religious belief, if any, may survive that scrutiny. The process is hardly completed. This atheist keeps watch on the process and remains unconvinced by any religions offered so far. What does the atheist believe in, if not religion? The atheist is unable to accept supernaturalism, and therefore the atheist is a naturalist. Naturalism, as Dr. Craig mentioned, can be briefly defined as the belief that the only reality is the physical universe of energy and matter as gradually discovered by our intelligence using the tools of experience, reason, and science working together. Many people are naturalists because they are impressed with science's ability to produce reliable knowledge and by deciding that the supernatural cannot be reasonably supported by experience, reason, or science. On the other hand, many supernaturalists remain comfortable with the supernatural because they've decided that naturalism, uh, using experience, reason, and science, cannot prove supernaturalism false. Some supernaturalists additionally believe that scientific knowledge as well can be used to positively support belief in the supernatural. Theological defenses of supernaturalism sometimes appeal to reliable human knowledge about the natural world, and they try to formulate hypotheses about the supernatural that are harmoniously consistent with science's best theorizing about the natural world. Let me be clear about this point. In order to be a supernaturalist, it is hardly necessary to reject the existence of the natural world or to reject science's knowledge of it. In a sense, most religious people are naturalists too. They do believe in the existence of the natural world, they accept the evidence of common sense about the world, and they accept most or perhaps all of science's knowledge about the world. So what really divides the naturalist from the supernaturalist is the additional question of whether one should believe in the supernatural over and above the natural. To proceed from the natural world to the supernatural world, metaphorical bridges of theological reasoning, such as we've heard some already from Dr. Craig, must be constructed and successfully crossed. The supernaturalist has the obligation to provide strong bridges. The naturalist in response argues that all of these bridges fail to be reasonably strong enough. The varieties of supernatural bridges fall into various categories. We've heard some tonight. But to defend naturalism and to reject supernaturalism, the naturalist has to explain why all of these bridges fail because their arguments are too weak to support the passage to naturalism. Often the supernaturalist will construct many, many, many bridges, attempting to build up a good case for supernaturalism with numerous arguments. Now, if one of these bridges, just one, were reasonably strong enough, the supernaturalist would take the advantage over the naturalist, and then people ought to believe in both the natural and supernatural worlds. Since naturalists are skeptical that any of these bridges are strong enough, they conclude that there's no reasonable way to get to naturalism. The large number of weak theological bridges impress any naturalist. Okay? If you want to safely cross a deep mountain chasm, having a dozen flimsy bridges available to you should not be, uh, make you more confident of your chances of getting safely across to the other side. Now, Dr. Craig has described several arguments trying to bridge this chasm to supernaturalism. I'm going to proceed to make some skeptical observations about these bridges in a more sort of general way. We will additionally have uh, a debate and rebuttal time to get into the heart of the details of many of these arguments. So you'll forgive me in my opening statement if I remain at a more general level trying to give you an impression of what it's like to be an atheist and a naturalist, and we'll get down to uh, 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 hard details soon enough. Now, an atheist is a naturalist who is skeptical about supernaturalism. Atheism does not rest on proving that supernaturalism is false. This is key. Defenders of religion who construct hypotheses about God sometimes announce that these hypotheses cannot be proven false, so therefore they must be true. No. Theologians who design their God so carefully that no actual evidence could ever disapprove it sometimes think their job is done. 
They seem to be saying, since you can't prove my God doesn't exist, you must admit my God does exist. Such theologians are making three basic logical errors. First, things can't exist just because we can't prove otherwise. An atheist is reasonable because no argument for supernaturalism is strong enough. The burden of proof about God is entirely on the theologian's shoulders. Second, hypotheses do not become more reasonable by adapting to fit all possible evidence. Science does not work that way, despite common misconceptions. Scientific hypotheses earn belief by correctly predicting future new evidence. A hypothesis that can survive any and all evidence makes evidence irrelevant. And so that hypothesis gains no support from any evidence. Third, lots of theologians can design their gods to be evidence proof. If dozens or hundreds of different supernaturalisms are all claiming to be true in this way, can the atheist be blamed for refusing to accept any of them? In a weird sort of way, if all of them can claim to be true, none of them can be true. Now, when atheists are confronted by these sorts of overconfident theologians and their evidence-proof hypotheses about gods, atheists wonder what happened to good old-fashioned traditional theology. Where did the natural theology of the 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries go? 19th century theology confronted evolution and lost. Maybe 20th century theology lost its nerve, too, and largely gave up on competing with science for explaining what is going on within the natural universe. Some 20th century theologians went to the extreme position that the most genuine faith is the one that endures despite being completely rationally absurd. Now, atheism can't reason or debate with that sort of irrationalism. Other 20th century theologians were chased out of nature, but they clung to the edges of the universe, claiming that only supernaturalism can account for the most general features of the universe and for the existence of the very, uh, uh, for the existence of the universe at all. Now this kind of what I call theology at the edge at least offers arguments for God that can be rationally debated, and we've heard a couple tonight. However, such theology still makes no empirically testable predictions, but is simply happy to proceed from whatever science has established so far about nature. Theology at the edge can always keep its marginal place, no matter how far science advances, so long as it always adapts to stay compatible with all scientific knowledge. With the theologies at the edge permanently entrenched in the mysterious darkness beyond science's light, atheism will always have competition and naturalism will always seem incomplete. Does the atheist deny that dark mysteries will always lurk beyond the known universe? Of course not. The atheist simply refuses to believe any speculative supernatural hypotheses, especially when they refuse to positively contribute to knowledge of how nature itself works. Some of Dr. Craig's arguments for God are good examples of how to do theology at the edge. Since theology at the edge is quite happy to admit that nature surely exists and that science can gain much knowledge about nature, the atheist tonight will not have to waste time establishing these facts. Of course, now, there are some religions that view nature as only illusion and science as completely delusional, but we won't have to debate whether naturalism is delusional here tonight in this context. The question again is whether we should also accept supernaturalism in addition to believing in the existence of nature. The atheist position is that we should not. The darkness that surrounds our current knowledge is, for the atheist, just more unknown nature to be explored. That's the atheist's alternative conservative hypothesis. Can the atheist now prove that beyond the known natural world lies only more nature? No such proof is possible. Naturalism at the edge is more reasonable, not because it can be proven true or because supernaturalism can be proven false, but rather because we already place some confidence in science's expanding knowledge, while little confidence can be placed in theology's shrinking retreat. Now just consider the heavy price that must be paid by a theology at the edge. What sort of god must this theologian like Dr. Craig design in order to survive at the fringes and margins of knowledge? Dr. Craig's god, for example, must exist in a timeless, eternal, unchanging state before creating the universe. According to Dr. Craig's argument that nature must have a definite beginning, nothing real could be infinitely long in duration. For God, Dr. Craig's God then to be real apart from the natural universe, God cannot exist in time before the natural universe exists. No time, therefore no change. And so Dr. Craig's God could not, for example, make any plans, think through ideas, or do anything while in this eternal state. 
Now, Dr. Craig complains that we cannot conceive of an infinite series of events. Now, Dr. Craig decides this because he says infinities, infinities contain contradictions. Now, mathematicians, in fact, actually define what infinite sets are in terms of such contradictions. No implications about reality follow from this at all, and mathematicians should not be consulted about reality. Okay? Now, now Dr. Craig complains that we cannot conceive of an infinite series of events, right? Now, now perhaps, I'm, I'm trying to be a humble guy here, perhaps such an infinite is indeed beyond human imagination. But just because something's beyond current human imagination has no bearing on reality either. Reality is doing whatever it's doing regardless of whether or not we're able to conceive of it. We need to take a different tactic here. For example, is God's eternality any easier for our imaginations? Here, who, who really holds the advantage in this debate here? And Dr. Craig also tells us that this eternal, unchanging, perfect God is a person. I see no analogy, however, between living people who have to think through their actions and suffer through their experiences and a frozen, crystalline God who needs the natural universe in order to make a decision or change his mind or to learn what suffering is like. But all this is a problem for Dr. Craig to explain to ordinary Christians, not to this atheist, I don't care, I don't have a dog in this fight. I am only pointing out the extremes to which a theologian must go. Now here's another example. Dr. Craig likes debating naturalists who hold that all space, time, energy, and matter originated in the Big Bang. Dr. Craig wants us to apply the principle of sufficient reason, as it's traditionally called, demanding explanations for each and everything in order so that he can show that we need to hypothesize a supernatural explanation for nature. Now, it's inconvenient, therefore, for Dr. Craig to encounter other naturalists who do respect reason's demand for sufficient explanation. Now, when theology says, for example, that God's the one thing that needs no further explanation, naturalists wonder how nature itself got ruled out. What if nature is the law? Now, many cosmologists are designing, for example, natural explanations for the Big Bang postulating more universe beyond the known visible universe, or even more universes, as Dr. Craig uh, mentioned, multiverses and, and uh, perhaps an infinite number. Now, Dr. Craig complains that no such uh, hypotheses about multiple universes has been proven. We all realize that. Now, the atheist respects reason and admires adventurous scientists who push into the dark frontiers of nature, constantly expanding our conception of reality. Now, not so long ago, people believed that the Earth was at the center of a small starry sphere. Then our solar system became just a grain of sand in a vast galaxy. Then our galaxy just became one lost among a trillion more. Can we still be surprised that science might next cast our visible universe into a possibly infinite array of other universes? All we need as naturalists is to offer one speculative hypothesis to stand against the supernaturalist's hypothesis. Neither of us can prove these to be true, neither of us can prove them to be false, but in a stalemate debate like that, the atheist wins because the more reasonable position is the conservative position. Stick with what you know. All right, now let me continue. I agree, our planet is special indeed. It appears designed for us and evolution explains why. The universe, however, does not appear to be especially designed for life. The modern day theologian of the edges doesn't really carry the way anymore. If the naturalist points out that all sorts of other kinds of life could exist in universes where the laws of nature were different, the theologian says, no, no, our God wanted just this universe exactly, just what's best for us. And so this God is made, made immune from all evidence. If the naturalist goes the other way to complain about all of the obvious natural imperfections and natural evils of this harsh, hostile universe, the theologian then can twist around and say, no, no, our God wanted just this universe exactly, even if it doesn't seem best for us. And again, God is evidence proof. Theology at the edges needs to keep God in the dark and deep in mystery. The atheist doesn't want to live in the dark, finding it more reasonable to live in the light. Now I'm going to proceed very quickly in three minutes to give a brief outline of responses to Dr. Craig's arguments about morality, the biblical authority, and revelation. They're going to go by real fast, but I already told you at the beginning, in these opening statements, we're not going to be able to get in the nuts and bolts of what the other guy just said. 
there's going to be rebuttal time following, so stay tuned. This is going to go fast. <laughs> Dr. Craig describes these objective moral values and truths as truths entirely independent from humanisms, right? They are what they are, completely independent of what any or all of us think, humanity collectively. However, when he defines it that way, he begs the question. He defines morality in a way that already transcends us and appears to win the argument without any effort at all. Fallacy. We need to redefine some terms here. Let's mean by objective simply the opposite of subjective or dependent on just what you or me. Now, I agree in one sense that there are objective moral truths. I don't believe that there are any absolute moral truths. Dr. Craig was correct in quoting me accurately from my website, but you need to understand the distinction between objectivity and absolute, okay? Objective truths can still be true in a sense that is relative to humanity, but not to subjective personal whims. Take, for example, science. Science yields objective truths, but they're the result of our effort, and they may be revisable in the future. We should trust science's knowledge, even knowing that we humbly have to admit it might be corrected in the future by us humans. Absolute moral truths, on the other hand, completely transcend humanity. Now, uh, I don't believe that any single religion can be trusted to tell us what these moral truths are. He mentions a few. I don't have any objection to them. I believe in them. Okay? So in my rebuttal, stay tuned for what more I have to say about the relationship between religion and morality. I claim that there are objective moral truths in the sense that we can all agree on them and ought to agree on them. They're not subjective, but they're not absolute either in the sense that Dr. Craig needs them to be to make his point. All right, a couple real quick words about his appeal to the Bible and to mysticism. Dr. Craig talks about the Bible as being an authority. What we need is other sources outside of the Bible. Dr. Craig doesn't cite any. He talks about personal experience. Well, Christians experience Jesus, Hindus experience Krishna. Uh, these things are culturally relative and have no bearing on what reality is ultimately like. Thank you for listening to my opening statement. Thank you, Dr. Shook. Uh, one thing that we did forget at the beginning, if anyone has any cell phone which might still be making noise, please turn it off. I, I'm very happy that it didn't come up in the 40 minutes we've had already, so I hope it doesn't uh, in the future. Uh, the other thing, very good table thumping technique, enthusiasm could be a bit better. Okay. Um, so now we have a 12-minute each rebuttal period so they can, the debaters can directly address the points that were made on the opposite side of the debate. So here's where we will hopefully see the debate start to heat up a little bit. And to begin that, I'd like to invite Dr. Craig back to the table. You'll remember that I said in my first speech I was going to defend two basic contentions in tonight's debate. The first one is that there's no good reason to think that naturalism is true. Now it was striking as we listened to Dr. Shook in his opening speech that he presented no argument that naturalism is true. Remember, naturalism is the view that physical reality is all there is, that there is nothing beyond the physical world. And in fact, Dr. Shook can't present any argument to prove that. Indeed, he actually admits it. Uh, for example, on his website, he says, it is impossible to prove by experience, reason, or science that nothing supernatural exists. But that is what naturalism affirms, that nothing supernatural exists. Physical reality is all there is, and yet he admits you can't prove it by reason, science, and experience. This is just to admit that naturalism cannot be proved true. It can only be accepted by faith. But the problem is, you see, naturalism forbids taking anything by faith. He says, again on the website, if naturalism needs outside assistance with fully understanding its own foundations, then naturalism is evidently incomplete and false. So in order to be a naturalist, you have to deny the foundations of naturalism, namely reason, science, and experience are the only sources of authority, because otherwise you can't believe that the natural world is all there is. 
Now, in his opening speech, Dr. Shook said, but an atheist isn't someone who denies that God exists. He's just someone without belief in God. I'm afraid that's not the traditional definition of what an atheist is. The Encyclopedia of Philosophy, a standard reference work, says, according to the most usual definition, an atheist is a person who maintains that there is no God. And that's what the naturalist maintains. Uh, to say an atheist is simply someone who lacks a belief in God is to confuse atheism with agnosticism. An agnostic doesn't have a belief in God, but he doesn't deny God exists. Or with those who think that the question of God's existence is just a meaningless question. So naturalism is committed to the view that the physical world is all there is. Atheism is committed to the, world that there, to the view that there is no supernatural and that there is no God. The difficulty, as you see, is that you can't prove that simply by showing that arguments for God don't work. Kai Nielsen is a prominent Canadian philosopher from Calgary University. This is what he says. He's an atheist. He says, to show that an argument is invalid or unsound is not to show that the conclusion of the argument is false. All of the proofs of God's existence may fail, but it may still be the case that God exists. In short, to show that the proofs do not work is not enough by itself. It may still be the case that there is a God. So Dr. Shook has got to do more than just destroy those bridges he claims I'm trying to build across the chasm. He's got to show that there's nothing on the other side to get to, that there is nothing beyond the physical world. Trouble is, he can't do it. He admits that reason, science, and experience can't establish naturalism, and therefore naturalism is fundamentally incoherent. When it comes to establishing its own foundations, it requires outside assistance, which means, in his own words, that it is incomplete and therefore false. So we've seen no good reason tonight to think that naturalism is true. It's, it's a huge lacuna in tonight's debate. Now, what about the arguments that I gave to show that supernaturalism is true? Number one, I suggested that the origin of the universe points beyond nature to a transcendent cause of the universe. The fact is that nature had a beginning in the finite past and came into existence. And since something can't come out of nothing, there must be a transcendent cause. Now here Dr. Shook uh, responds to my philosophical arguments for the beginning of the universe by saying that we shouldn't take our or consult mathematicians about what exists. Now that surprised me when he said that because that's my point, that's what I'm saying, is that if something is mathematically possible, that doesn't mean it can really exist. And indeed, with respect to the infinite, you can show that self-contradictions arise if you try to subtract infinity from infinity. If you have an infinite number of baseball cards, you can give every odd-numbered card away. And you're going to wind up, as I say, with self-contradictions when you take infinity from infinity. So that's, that's my point, is that uh, mathematics is not a guide to reality. Uh, indeed, there are uh, things that might be possible to do mathematically, but they're not meaningful or possible physically. So I don't think he's been able to deal with the logical contradictions that would result if an infinite number of things could actually exist. What about the evidence for the beginning of the universe from contemporary cosmology? Here he says, well, uh, maybe a multiverse will avoid the beginning. Uh, again, I've already refuted that in my opening speech. The bohr guth vilenkin theorem developed in 2003 shows that any universe, including an inflationary multiverse, cannot be extended infinitely into the past. You reach a past space-time boundary in a finite amount of time about 13.7 billion years ago. So we have both good philosophical arguments, that's reason, we have scientific evidence, that's science, two of the arbiters of truth proposed by the naturalist that both point to a beginning of the universe, and therefore to a transcendent cause. Now Dr. Shook says, but God would be a timeless person, and that's just inconceivable. How is that any better than an infinite past? Well, an infinite past isn't just unimaginable. It leads to logical contradictions, as I said. But I don't see any logical incoherence in the idea of a timeless person. A timeless person would simply be a changeless, self-conscious being who exists outside of our four-dimensional space-time continuum. That is the traditional concept of God, all the way going back to Aristotle. This is nothing new. This isn't, uh, what did he call it, theology at the edge. This is the traditional classical concept of God, that God is the creator of time and space and exists outside of time and space. 
So I don't think he's been able to refute either of those two premises that whatever begins to exist has a cause. We have good grounds for thinking the universe began to exist, and it follows deductively from that that therefore the universe has a cause. Now what about my second argument for the fine-tuning of the universe uh, and not being due to physical necessity or to chance and therefore due to design? Here I saw no refutation other than some vague reference to natural imperfections in the universe, but notice my argument here isn't appealing to biological evolution. My argument is not denying that. It's fully compatible with the typical Darwinian story. I'm going back to the initial conditions of the universe, which in recent years have been discovered to be fine-tuned for the existence of intelligent life with a precision and delicacy that is simply incomprehensible. And you've got to explain this by either saying it's physically necessary, but that contradicts everything that physics is telling us about these constants and quantities, or else you've got to say that it resulted from chance alone, and I looked at the attempt to defend chance by the multiverse hypothesis and gave two arguments against it. So I think that argument still stands. What about objective moral values? I said that if God does not exist, objective moral values do not exist, but in moral experience, and again, experience is one of the arbiters of truth for the naturalist, we apprehend a realm of objective moral values from which it follows that God exists. Now here Dr. Schuch says he believes that there are objective values but not absolute values. But notice how he defends objective, defines objective. Objective is something that we can all agree on. Well, I don't think that on the naturalist view there are even objective values in that sense. The psychopath doesn't agree that uh, it's wrong to torture and rape little children. The Nazi National Socialists didn't think it was wrong to send Jews and gypsies to the, to the gas chambers. The apartheid supporting Afrikaner in South Africa didn't think there was anything wrong with racial discrimination. You see, these moral principles on Dr. Shook's naturalism are objective only in the sense that the recommendations for agriculture are objective. It is objectively true that if you want to grow corn, then you should use fertilizer. That, that's an objective principle. Similarly, if you want to, if you're a psychopath and you want to have the greatest pleasurable experience, then you ought to torture and rape your victims. It's objective in that sense. You see, he says that moral values are just practical prescriptions of recommended actions for achieving a certain goal. And those goals are relative to each individual, to various societies, whether Nazi Germany society, apartheid South Africa, killing fields in Cambodia, communist uh, Soviet Russia, they're, they're relative, or relative to the human race. It, it doesn't matter. All of these are equally value, valid. So it seems to me that it's very clear that on Dr. Shook's view, there are not objective values in the sense that these are valid and binding apart from human opinion. Uh, except in the sense that these are these practical recommendations. If you want to do this, then you should do that. And that, as I say, is massively, massively contrary to moral experience. So if you agree with me that it is better to love a little child and nurture him rather than to torture and rape that little child, if you think there is a moral difference between those two, then you should agree with me that God exists. On the naturalist's view, there is no way to found a realm of objective moral values because in nature, whatever is is right. We are just a relatively advanced primate species and have no more intrinsic value than a species of bonobo or, uh, or apes. What about the resurrection of Jesus? I pointed out that today historians agree on the fact of the empty tomb, the appearances of Jesus, the origin of the disciples' belief. These are historical facts, again, what the naturalist would appeal to. And therefore, they need some explanation. How do you explain these? I can't think of any better explanation than the explanation the disciples gave, that God raised Jesus from the dead. Dr. Shook responds by saying, well, you're taking the Bible as your authority. No, I am not. I am treating the Bible as an ordinary collection of historical documents comparable to Thucydides or Herodotus or other ancient works and uh, investigating them historically and these are the facts that historians have determined as a result. So I'm not appealing to the authority or inspiration of the Bible here but treating them as ordinary historical documents. Finally, what about immediate experience of God? He says, well, experiences are relative that people have experiences of Krishna. Right. 
And I would say that a person has a right to believe in what he experiences unless he has some sort of a defeater for that experience, unless there's some reason to think that he is deluded or uh, incorrect, he has a right to go on the basis of that experience. And experience is one of the means of truth that the naturalist believes in. So why does he deny religious experience? Why exclude that as part of the rich human tapestry of experience? It seems to me that in the absence of any defeater, any argument for atheism, and we've not heard one tonight, I'm perfectly rational, perfectly within my rights, to continue to believe on the basis of my experience that God exists. Thank you, Dr. Craig. I would now like to invite Dr. Shook to make another 12-minute rebuttal. Now you see how the guy who gets to go second really falls behind fast. So I got a lot of catching up to do, but let's start with some preliminary complaints about Dr. Craig's claims that I haven't proven squat. Let's find out. Now, I say again, that a sufficiently evidence-proof supernaturalism, a supernaturalism that is compatible with any and all anything that science goes to the trouble of bothering to find out is a supernaturalism. Yeah, it can't be proven false. How does this help the supernaturalist? I can't prove Sa Santa Claus doesn't exist either. Maybe Santa Claus has a hidden secret invisible castle up at North Pole. Theologians are very intelligent people with powerful imaginations. For every supernaturalist hypothesis on offer from this Christian, there are hundreds more. What's an atheist to do? Somehow, they can't all be true. When the atheist shrugs his shoulders and refuses to believe any of them, who looks more rational? Now, Dr. Craig wasn't paying attention to my argument for naturalism, so I will go to the trouble of repeating it. My argument for naturalism is precisely two claims. Sound familiar? Follow me. Number one, nature exists. Number two, no supernaturalist hypothesis, no bridge is reasonable. And furthermore, by the way, if you don't have a bridge to the other side, if you have no idea how to cross it, you have no reason to think there's something else waiting for you at the end. You're going in the irrational chasm. When Dr. Craig claims, well, I must be right because he can't prove me false, you see we have this sort of schoolyard juvenile logic operating here, and I think we're adults. Now, let's get back to the concrete details of the arguments. An atheist... To repeat, by my definition, does not believe in any god, anything supernatural, and lives without religion. Some of the things that I've said, for example, you cannot prove a sufficiently transcendent, evidence-proof, supernaturalist hypothesis false, sounds more like agnosticism. I cannot waste time here getting into the terminological debates. Is atheism kind of like agnosticism or really different? Atheists and agnostics can't agree with each other. I pity poor Dr. Craig to try to figure that out as well. So let's drop it. Let's stick with my definitions because this is my time. Now, <laughs> Craig goes on to talk about how, uh, you know, this business of the multiverse is, uh, you know, silly and, and uh, hasn't been proven. I told you it hasn't been proven. This is cutting edge stuff. It's kind of weird that Dr. Craig would appeal to one current scientific cosmological theory uh, you know, that's a profound respect by a, ca a Christian theologian for, for some contemporary scientific theory, a shining example, actually. I wish we're more respected. But it leads him into trouble because now the naturalist grasps that any current scientific theory is just that. It's bound to get modified or entirely replaced, possibly within our lifetimes, if not sooner. The idea of the multiverse is being explored, and there are more hypotheses waiting. There's a lot of darkness out there to be explored by science. When the supernaturalist says, well, this scientist says that, and this scientist says that, the naturalist says, so what? The pantheon of scientists that have been completely wrong would fill this room, okay? All scientists only partially grasp at reality. This is humility on the part of the naturalist. It's not an admission that naturalism is false. If Dr. Craig doesn't think nature exists, I'd like to hear one positive argument for that. 
All right? The problem is we're at the very edges of speculative knowledge. All right. Now, I have to say a little bit about the fine-tuning argument before finishing up my promised explanation of what I have to say about morality, the Bible, and mystical experience. Now, it is true that if certain fundamental properties of our universe were slightly different, then the type of organic, earthly-like life that we presently understand would not be possible. However, for all we know, other kinds of life could flourish under quite different fundamental properties of nature. We are simply ignorant of the possibilities. Now, the theologian could counter-argue by saying that a supernatural being has an overriding aim to ensure the existence of forms of life just like us. Now, this refined supposition would need much additional argument to support it. We haven't heard any of that tonight. Perhaps we will. And such an argument eventually resorts to suspiciously theological or scriptural dogmas for premises. Since there's no obvious reason why a very intelligent and powerful God would even bother creating life, perhaps life is an accidental byproduct of the creation of what this God really wants, like lots of sand or something. You know? <laughs> Alternatively, uh, you know, uh, you, you could try to say, well, God is so good, okay, that, that really puts human beings again at the center of the universe. I, I, you know, I like human beings. Uh, you know, I'm fond of them. I'm, I'm actually one of them myself. So, uh, but I also think that a Christian, a, a religious believer, should have profound respect for all the rest of creation as well, and perhaps humanity needs to be humbled. Our planet needs us to do this. It could also be pointed out, Dr. Craig's a theist, he believes in one supreme being. He's actually given no argument that there is only one supreme being operating here. Many other sorts of kinds of gods could equally be hypothesized as responsible for creating the universe or controlling the existence of life in our universe, such as a committee of powerful but uncaring gods that enjoy experimenting with life, or a god that's actually partially evil, for all we know. Furthermore, this universe is actually quite inhospitable to life as we know it, since locations favoring organic life seem to be quite rare. We tenuously cling to existence on the surface of an unpredictable planet lost among countless solar systems where Earth-like planets might be scarce. But now perhaps there is a good bit of other kinds of life available out there, don't know. Uh, it's too soon to be talking about probabilities and saying that the naturalist has a low probability here. We are simply too ignorant to make these sorts of arguments. Now, let me proceed to morality. I told you. No single religion can be trusted to tell us what they are, these special objective or perhaps moral truths. The special authority of one lone God has never been much help. The Bible alone appears to endorse a wide variety of moral rules, most of which Christians don't follow anyway. Even if small sections of the Bible are isolated, such as certain sayings of Jesus, they are so highly idealistic and vaguely general that Christians ever since have had a hard time agreeing on what they specifically require. Over the past two millennia, Christians have disagreed over war, slavery, capital punishment, the rights of women, the justice of capitalism, what form of government God would approve. Ironically, the little specific agreement that Christians have reached by now has been reached by consultations among theologians and democratic voting in ecclesiastical conventions and assemblies. Now, reliance on democratic methods is especially ironic here, since the Bible nowhere approves of mass democracy, a fact that has kept kings and aristocracies in power for many centuries. Despite this obstacle, Christians who were tired of tyranny and religious warfare put their faith in democracy and the rule of law. No longer would the legitimacy of law ultimately reside on any king. In democracies everywhere, people are committed to the objective truth of basic laws protecting rights and liberties. We don't need kings because we each have each other to sustain objective law and pass it on with needed adjustments to the next generations. Now, according to Dr. Craig's argument, if its reasoning was valid, democracy would never work unless all citizens recognized a supremely kingly lawgiver. But his reasoning is valid no longer. And just as objective law has been liberated, so has objective morality.